I want you to do is give me the uh, full name of Opal and then spell the complete name so we got it right for the record and then your date of birth. Okay? Opal, do you want to give us your full name? Yes. And your date of birth and spell it for us, please. Um, my full name is uh, Eldana, but I'm known as Opal. Uh, my middle name is Ann, and my last name is Skinnador. Uh, Eldana is spelled A L D O N A. Can you spell that real loud because I have to write it down here, please? Oh, and slow. Oh, all right. We'll start over again. Mm -hmm. uh, my legal name is Eldana, A L D O N A, but I'm known as Opal. O P A L. My middle name is Ann, A N N. And my last name is Scanandor, S K E N A N D O R E. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Would you give us your date of birth? I was born May 24th, 1940. Right. And where were you born? I was born in Milwaukee and raised also in Milwaukee. Okay. And uh, give us the name of your parents. Um, I was raised in a foster home by an Oneida couple um, by the name of Julius and Susan Summers. Uh, she was a metoxin. And uh, I was uh, about the age of three, they took me in, and I stayed with them uh, all my life mm -hmm. until okay. they passed on. So that's your, that's your parents then? In, in, in my heart, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about them. Uh, and what was the, what was your uh, father's name? Julius Summers. Julius Summers. Mm -hmm. All right. And um, what uh, do you know? What kind of background he uh, he had in education? He went to uh, Flandreau School. Um, he was sent home because of. Uh, uh, TB, and then later went back again, and then from there he enlisted in the army in 1917, I believe, in the First World War. So he really didn't have that many years there because he was home for recovery because of his TB. TB. Hmm. And uh, did he speak Oneida? Did he? Yes, very fluently. Mm -hmm. And what kind of work did he do? He worked in Milwaukee. Well, when he got out of the service, he worked for a short time in Detroit um, for uh, one of the automobile um, companies. And then he uh, came back here to Oneida, and he worked um, in the lumber mills. And then from there, he went to Milwaukee, and, uh, and he got a job at Greenbaum Tanneries as a leather worker and uh, worked for them until he retired. Well, that has been a lot of years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, now, your, uh, your mother then, uh, what was her educational background? Uh, she went to school also out in Flandreau, and she stayed, I think, through the eighth, ninth grade, and then she continued working for them at the school as a matron for approximately another eight to ten years before she returned to Oneida. And then she went to Milwaukee, and then Julius and Susan met there, and um, they married and uh, established a home there. Do you know uh, approximately when they got married? About 1930, 29, somewhere in there. And uh, did they have any other children? Yes, they had uh, three children. Ethel May Summers, who now lives out in California. Uh, they had a young son, Gerald, who passed away after six months and their own Eldana, who they lost uh, when she was around three years old. That's why my name is... Well, you're uh, named after their, their yeah, other daughter. Yeah. It was hard for them to call me Eldana, so I they suppose, yeah. called me Opal after uh, Susan's birthstone of October. So they had one child besides yourself that in, you know, over the years then? Actually, the other two that had passed away? Yeah, of their own children, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. But mm -hmm. they raised a number of uh, foster children. Well, they did. There were uh, two other girls, uh, Steffa's girls, Esther and Ruth, that were before me. And then I came into uh, the family about 43, 44. I'm not sure of the exact year. 
And then uh, about 45, they took in four other foster girls that were of the same family, the Steffes family, uh, Doris, Shirley, Dolores, and Celia. And then uh, we just had people coming in and out of the home all the time. Um, my dad's niece, Henrietta, she stayed with us for a while. And then when we moved to into Milwaukee, we were out originally from the airport. Um, then uh, Susan's uh, nephews, Gerald, stayed with us for a while. Carl Skinnerdor, they both got out of the service at the same time and stayed with us. Russell or Metoxin stayed with us. Um, Susan's father, after his wife passed away out here from in Oneida in the 40s, he stayed with us for a few years until he passed on about 1953. And uh, then there was Susan's brother, Chauncey. He stayed with us for several years. And uh, let's see, I'm trying to think of who else. But there was, it was a revolving door, it was a revolving door, people going in and out. And one of the things that I remember is that we had a big table where everybody sat all the time. And then I was about the youngest. I and, and Doris who was the second youngest. We sat at a smaller table. And it was years before I worked my way up to that adult table. And I no sooner got up space at the adult table and somebody would move in and I'd be back to that small table again. So uh, when I officially got to sit with the adults, that was quite an accomplishment, it seemed, because we had so many people coming and going all the time. Uh, <coughs> what part of Milwaukee did you live in, north side or south side? South side. South side? Uh, we originally lived off of uh, uh, 16th and Vuit when I first came with the Summers family. Then when they decided to take in more foster children, they moved out to um, Layton Avenue out near the airport. And then um, because they had so many foster children, the uh, welfare service said they needed a bigger home um, for more rooms. And so we moved to uh, South Union Street. Um, and uh, that was about 1947, and uh, I'm still there. Uh, so I've been in that home for um, over 50 years. Were you in the same home yet? Still in the same house, yeah. Oh, wow. After my folks passed on, then I, I bought the house from Ethel. Oh, I see. So, I'm in a big, big castle. <laughs> <laughs> now, did um, did your mother speak Oneida? Yes, yeah, they both spoke fluent Oneida. Did they make any attempt to uh, try to teach the, you know, the, the young ones? Actually, it was the opposite. They said uh, we wouldn't have use for the language. I think the boarding school experience um, taught them that uh, not to use the language. Uh, and when uh, Susan's uh, family would come, Lambert, Metoxin, and Nancy, they would all sit in the living room and all speak the language. Uh, so it, it was used also when they didn't want us children to know what they were talking about. Sometimes it was about us. And uh, so it was, uh, it was not passed down to us. And I'm sorry it wasn't. Yeah. You know. But at that time it didn't seem important. But uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, your your uh, your mother now did she work outside the home besides uh, raising children? She did off and on. Um, when Julius lost his job at Greenbaum, uh, the place closed down. Um, they were just getting their uh, what do you call that unemployment. And so she went out and she worked at St. John's Nursing Home in, in the laundry room um, to help out with the expenses. So uh, there were often on years that she worked. What, what kind of connection did they have and did you have with the, uh, you know, with the reservation here? Uh, Basically coming out uh, when Susan's uh, and Julius's folks were still living, uh, we often came out to bring food and clothing and to help out um, and to visit. We mostly went to Susan's um, parents, which was uh, Albert and Celicia Metoxen. And uh, Julius's uh, mother, I believe her name was Sarah, uh, Sarah Summers. Her, f uh, her husband had left him when uh, Julius was the youngest uh, and left home. So I didn't know his side of the family too well, but mostly the Metoxen side. I, was familiar with. And we used to come out in the 40s um, and stay with uh, Albert and Cilicia. And at that time, they didn't have any running water. 
uh, no electricity, uh, lived uh, pretty primitive, I guess, at the time. And then, uh, um, so Alicia passed away in the late, late 40s, and I can remember uh, the wake was held at the house, and the singers sang all night. And uh, then uh, they, I don't know how they uh, got rid of the farm, if they, uh, but then uh, Albert came and lived with us until he passed on in 53 in Milwaukee. Now, uh, what uh, church affiliation were your parents? Um, Episcopal. Episcopal. Um, and we attended All Saints Cathedral, where there were quite a few Oneida people that attended that church. Mm -hmm. Were there any things that uh, they talked about in terms of uh, the relationship or uh, background information that they gave you about, I mean, growing up, you know, at some point you begin to realize that you're in Oneida. Uh, but did they give you kind of any uh, reinforcement or background history to, you know, to, uh, you know, bring you to that point? Or is it just your exposure with other Oneidas that you, you got to know who you were? Um, basically, Julius and Susan were both active in all Indian facilities in Milwaukee. One of them was the Consolidated Tribes. They were both uh, active in that group. Uh, Susan was also uh, active with the All Saints Cathedral Women's Guild, was, which was mostly Oneida people. And uh, through the Consolidated, uh, they had me join the dance group in uh, around the age of seven, six, seven, and uh, whatever was going on in the Indian community, uh, we were all just exposed to it and participated. Now you say uh, they had you join the dance group. <coughs> what was that consisted of? You mean consisted of? Uh, uh, is it a, is that was that a tap dance group or was that a? <laughs> It was an Indian dance group okay. uh, started okay. by Elphia Smith. Mm -hmm. uh, he went at, uh, it was called Consolidated because it was not just Oneida people, it was uh, for all Indian people in the Milwaukee area. And uh, we basically had Chippewa uh, people as well as uh, Oneidas and Menominees and Potawatomis and Winnebago's that all participated. Uh, our biggest problem was uh, the lack of singers. Uh, we started out basically with Chippewa singers, and uh, sometimes Menominees, and sometimes the Winnebago's. But it was basically all woodland style singing, so we weren't exposed to what would later uh, be quite a variety of type of singing when you go to different parts of the country. Mm -hmm. But we had this group, and we'd go around and perform for schools or whatever LFS had uh, lined up for us. And I think, we got our biggest exposure when the Milwaukee Braves came to Milwaukee in 1953 because the whole thing was American Indians and we were the only Indian people or organization in the Milwaukee area so we, we participated in a lot of the functions that uh, the Braves asked us to take part in. It was a lot of fun. I know it has a lot to do in today's world where they say it's all stereotypes, that it's the wrong image, but uh, we didn't really have anybody to tell us what we were doing at that time that uh, we were you know, doing this typical stereotype thing that uh, people are relate to Indian people. We just went out and we danced and performed. I think basically we gave a good image for Indian people. Um, we uh, had different dances that we uh, did for uh, the general public, which were Native American dances, and we were Native people, and uh, I think we as a group uh, did a good job in representing Native people. But today I think it would be controversy. Um, they would be saying they're using Indians. But uh, I enjoyed myself. We had a good time. Now, you say at age seven mm -hmm. you started out uh, doing mm -hmm. that. Now, um, you know, at that time, compared to today, the styles, and the costumes or, or regalia or whatever you want to call it are, have changed a lot. Mm -hmm. Tell me what it was like at that time for uh, you know, a young girl like yourself starting out. Uh, well, you, didn't, did you, you didn't have a whole lot of role models, did you? No, we really didn't have any other than, no, very few. 
uh, and we weren't exposed to a lot of dancers. Uh, sometimes we'd get some, some Chicago dancers that would come and participate when there were events, sometimes the Winnebago people. But uh, uh, the Consolidated uh, went out and uh, hired somebody to make all the dance outfits. Uh, at that time, they had a fundraiser. They raised over $1,000 to have all the outfits made for all the dancers. And there was a group of around uh, maybe 15 to 20 of us that were dancing. So everything was furnished for us at that time. And what did you start out as in terms of your dancing? Uh, I know you moved into the hoop dance, but before that, you had to you had to learn some of the basics, I'm sure. Mm -hmm, yeah. Oh, we basically had rehearsals, which is kind of unheard of how, as to how dancers uh, learn, once a week. And uh, the singers would come and they would show us uh, this is a woman's dance and this is a man's dance. And uh, we just learned whatever they passed on to us. And then uh, when we went out and did performances, uh, we would do a women's dance. The girls went and did their portion and the boys did their, their section. And then they had uh, two boys Dewey Silas, in fact, uh, was an eagle dancer uh, back at that time, too. He danced with that group. And uh, Joe Webster, their specialty was the eagle dance. And then one of the uh, Steffes girls, Doris, she did a feather dance uh, where you would go down and pick up the feather. And she also did back bend and was able to pick up the feather. And then, then I was introduced to hoop dancing. And then Marlene Silas uh, was my hoop dance partner for a while. Joyce Skinnerdor, uh, and then uh, as time went along, then I kind of went out on my own and well, Who taught you to, uh, uh, to do the hoop dance to begin with? Uh, Sharon Deloney. Uh, I believe she's a Menominee gal, and Kenneth Paulus were the hoop dancers at that time. And they were both, uh, one was moving to Kansas and the other was uh, just, I guess, giving up dancing, and so they taught us the basics and uh, uh, took it from there. Mm -hmm. um, where did you, uh, uh, being from a, it sounds like there was a, always a, a revolving door, as you put it, uh, in the family. So were there any other ones that, from the family that uh, started to dance when you did? Yes, in fact, all the Steffes girls, uh, Doris, Shirley, and Dolores. That's right, Celia was um, mm -hmm. married, she was gone, but, uh, the, and Ethel also danced when the group first formed in 1937 with the other two Steffes girls. Uh, we have some pictures of them at, back home. And then uh, all uh, four of us girls were exposed to Indian dancing. Now, did you have a, a narrator or an MC? Alpheus normally did this. Mm -hmm. what, what kind of a, f give me a, uh, kind of like a program, if you will, of, you know, when you start out and he would, would they have a special sequence of, of dances and things that they'd go through and what he would talk about? Uh, do you remember that? Well, we'd, we'd do a small grand entry when we'd come mm -hmm. in. The singers would be out there and the boys would go first and the girls would come second. And then Alpheus would get up and give a greeting to the audience and then uh, say he was going to have a, a power song or war dance and uh, that everybody would uh, take part in that. Then they would do a, a woman's dance. Uh, and it was a woodland style, so you had your sides stepping, uh, different than what you basically see today. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, then you would have your specialty dances. Uh, Doris would do her feather dance, and then I would do a hoop dance, and then Dewey and uh, Joe would do an eagle dance, and then we'd have a group dance, and that was basically the, the lineup of how the programs went. Okay. Was there any historical background that uh, Alpheus would give? Not really. No? No, not really. Just uh, mention uh, the organization of the Consolidated Tribe and the purpose of it was to uh, keep uh, Indian uh, culture um, awareness uh, for our urban uh, people. Mm -hmm. Now, where did you start school? I uh, started school at Burdick. That's where I went to kindergarten when we were still lived out near the airport. And then when we moved into Milwaukee, then I attended uh, Alexander Mitchell uh, from first grade to sixth grade. Then I went to uh, Walker Junior High School from seventh to ninth grade. And then my high school years were 
from South Division from 10th until uh, graduation. Now, uh, going through school, did you have any, uh, any hobbies or extracurricular activities you were involved in? Sports. sports? I, I, I enjoyed sports. I played a lot of softball and volleyball and uh, I did uh, some field hockey. Whatever the school offered in uh, sports activities. In fact, the sports led to uh, playing for the All Indian Girls softball team that uh, Ruth Baird from the uh, All Saints Church, uh, with uh, Frank Baird being the coach. And we had pretty nice uniforms. We had red and gray uh, uniforms, and uh, they said Bravets on there. Yes, so what? Bravets, they said, <laughs> <laughs> at the Milwaukee Braves. Okay. And uh, so I, uh, I played softball starting in junior high uh, with uh, the uh, recreation department. And uh, basketball, I did some of that. And uh, oh, then I also played clarinet for several years, uh, junior high. I played uh, the dance band and the orchestra and the regular band. And then in high school, I played for one year in the uh, senior band. Uh, and then we took part in parades and uh, football functions where we marched out in the field. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, that was basically what I was involved with, with sports and music. Now, what did you do during the summer times? Did you, get, did you uh, work out? Did I work out? It, you mean a job? First jobs, yeah. Well, uh, when I was still in high school my sophomore year, I joined Civil Air Patrol which was uh, auxiliary to the Air Force. And uh, it was much like the reserves. Every week you went to meetings. And uh, in the summertime you went to uh, summer camp for two weeks. And I had hopes of going into the Air Force, um, but due to uh, being under the uh, county, they wouldn't allow me to go until I was going to turn 21. And by that time I had gotten into other things. But uh, uh, Civil Air Patrol was search and rescue. And uh, like I said, it was a lot like the reserves. And um, started out as a private and worked my way up to a second lieutenant. Mm. Uh, went to summer camps. Uh, my second year, I was the female squadron commander. And then um, we had uh, one summer where we actually used our training where three boys went out on a raft on Lake Michigan. And uh, we, uh, we were called into service to uh, uh, do the uh, map uh, drawing for the search and rescue and the next morning we went up in helicopters and uh, did our search patterns and uh, we found the three boys but only one boy survived mm -hmm. the other two died from exposure but we got a chance to use what we were trained for and mm -hmm. uh, at the time uh, you don't realize how important all that training is until it's an actual emergency and it was a shame that we couldn't get to the boys soon enough yeah. But Civil Air Patrol was, uh, uh, I was also a part of the drill team, and uh, we used to go into competition, and we won state championship for three years, took a lot of practice, uh, many uh, weekends that we were out uh, practicing our drills. But uh, when we went to regional, we could never get past Michigan. Michigan always beat us by points. <laughs> but, you know, it, it was activities like that between sports and Civil Air Patrol. Uh, that uh, kept me busy, uh, and even being part of the consolidated tribe. I was never one to uh, get involved with the wrong group of people because of the activities that were in, uh, I was in. So uh, I think I had a pretty good upbringing, and my folks supported me whatever I did as long as I stayed out of trouble. So uh, uh, they never said no. Because at that time, sports were kind of looked down upon for women and even the service, uh, and but they said, "Is you know, you go out and just do what you want." And they gave me support, so I was quite active. And then even um, in my grade school years, I was a Girl Scout for several years, selling cookies and went to Girl Scout camp and was exposed to uh, to uh, just a good upbringing, I would say, mm -hmm. being active in a lot of things. Uh -huh. Okay, you finished, uh, finished high school, and then what did you do? Well, um, Ruth Baird um, recommended me for, uh, to go to some agency to get a job, 
and uh, they, they sent me to uh, uh, Wisconsin Compensation Rating Bureau, which was office work, and uh, I got hired. And uh, I graduated on Thursday, and Monday I had a job, and I worked for them for 11 years. And uh, in between that uh, 11 years, I also worked three years uh, at the uh, at Boston store. But when I was in high school, I worked uh, two summers at St. John's Nursing Home um, because when I was in Civil Air Patrol, I needed money to go to camp and uniforms and things like that. So uh, and even when I was younger, when I was in uh, sixth grade, um, I took a youngster back and forth to school to, to earn a dollar or two a week. So I was always working. It seemed like I had to earn my, my keep. So after uh, uh, I worked 11 years for this office, then I went to uh, Ellen Bradley in 1969 and got employed there, and uh, I'm still there today after 35 years. And what kind of work did you do at Ellen Bradley? Office work? No, I did uh, shop work. Um, oh. I moved from department to department to basically general assembly and machine operator, and I worked in shipping and uh, just I even worked in sanitation for a couple of years. As things went uh, up and down at the company, sometimes uh, you were on first shift, second shift, third shift, some departments moved out and you'd have to go to another department. And, you know, just various jobs. But today I'm a machine assembler operator. So. Well, you must have just about the most seniority there, right? Just about, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're the boss lady there now. <laughs> no, I'm still at the bottom of the ladder, but I have a seniority. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what do you, uh, how, long, how long do you plan on working to, as long as your health keeps up? Well, until I'm 65, uh, and then I have to work another six months uh, till the end of uh, next year to get full uh, Social Security benefits. So I might even go a little sooner, I, I'll, you know, I'm debating whether it's time to make the move or not. Mm -hmm. Monday I have to uh, uh, report to a new department because where I'm working right now is moving out. So I have a new challenge of going to a new department, learning new work again. There's no mandatory retirement, is there? No, no. no. We have, in fact, one lady that's 80 years old that is still, still working. And it's amazing that there are several people that are, have, um, that are past 65 that mm -hmm. have decided to stay. Well, you. Uh, I know one of your, one of your major. Uh, I guess, I don't know if I would even call it a hobby, but the thing that you do is is dance. I mean, you've got a reputation, probably worldwide for that. Mm -hmm. But um, is there any other things that you've gotten into besides uh, that you want to share with us? Uh, in uh, besides the dancing. The, well, I've always been interested in, in our culture, American Indian history. And one of the advantages that I had as being a dancer, traveling to an, a number of different uh, Indian uh, reservations, I'd always try to make a side trip to the museums or be especially uh, listen to what uh, announcers, when they talked about their culture, different events. And uh, I would attend uh, all the different things that UWM or Marquette or whatever the universities when they would have Native American Week, I'd try to uh, attend as many of those uh, events and coming up here to pick up the history conferences over the years and uh, just uh, trying to learn as much as I could. Um, this last fall I went to, uh, went back to school, MATC. I hadn't been in school since I graduated, and I didn't know what I was getting myself into, but I just uh, saw the course was being offered on Native American history, so I signed up for it. And once I got in class, I thought, what am I doing here? <laughs> uh, and I was fortunate to have a Native uh, instructor, a Chippewa lady, Donna Beckstrom. And uh, I really enjoyed the class, but I was uh, not used to having to read books and hand in reports. and and those exams, three exams, I like that was, <laughs> it was a time to get an ulcer to, but I got through with it. I, I got an A uh, and I was real proud of myself because uh, uh, when I was in school, I, 
I suppose I could have done better, but I was just an average student, so to get an A in a college course, I was, I really thought that was an accomplishment. So, uh, and then I plan to come up here again uh, for your history conference in October. And uh, then the next thing I got involved with about 10, 12 years ago was Oneida singing. And that, uh, I came across an old, one of those big records with Oscar Archiguet and those singers. And uh, Oscar Archiguet actually gave me a songbook back in 1950 when he was trying to get us young people interested. And it had been sitting in a cupboard for years. And when I heard that uh, record, I found that book and I sat there and I started uh, getting interested. And just about that time, uh, Jim Cooper was starting a group in Milwaukee. And uh, they were singing um, at the health center, which was having this grand opening. And I asked if I could join. And he said, sure, we're looking for singers. And so that's... Uh, Oh, I got started with that, and then Shirley LaFleur in Milwaukee, she uh, I, uh, sold me uh, some tapes. I bought tapes from here, and it was just a matter of uh, practicing and practicing. And then I got brave enough to come out here and start singing with the group out here. And uh, I got interested in the singing, um, I guess, because of culture again. It's one of the things that have been part of the uh, Oneida story, going back to New York, uh, according to Oscar Archiquet, as early as uh, 1669, there's uh, recordings of statements saying that there was Oneida singing. And a lot of our relatives, aunts and uncles and uh, people sang, and we're just carrying on a tradition. And we're servicing the community um, uh, at the wakes, and uh, I think that's important to uh, carry on our traditions that way. And uh, I wanted to uh, also get a connection with uh, with belonging to the Oneida tribe. I lived in Milwaukee and I traveled uh, so many different places, but I really didn't have a connection here. And I thought this was a good way of being able to uh, feeling a part of this community. And, uh, and now the singing is something I really, really enjoy. And I'll sing with any group, any time, any place if it's possible. <laughs> Good. Well, you're going to be going out to the opening of the new museum then, right? Oh, yes, I'm looking forward to that, yeah. It should be quite exciting. The whole atmosphere of uh, all these different people coming from all over the country and just trying to uh, think in as much as possible, as well as, you know, participating with the singing. It's quite an honor. You going to be doing any hoop dancing while you're there? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> Those hoops are in retirement now. Oh, okay, okay. We'll <laughs> and, they're, and they're so small. <laughs> yeah. uh, over the years, I mean, you've, you've been back and forth from uh, Milwaukee to Oneida a thousand times. And, and um, when did you begin to see or feel that uh, there was a change coming in Oneida uh, here in itself? Did, did, you, did, did it just kind of gradual or was didn't you see any at all? Or have you seen uh, what I guess we would call a lot of change? I think I've seen a lot of changes. I can remember back when my grandparents didn't have running water or electricity, uh, any modern facilities, and uh, with the policies of uh, a new uh, political system um, going into effect. But I guess really with the starting with the bingo and the casinos were the biggest changes. You have now the Turtle School, uh, you have Norbert Hill Center, your central business or your capital or city hall, whatever you want to call it. You have all these different other buildings throughout the res that uh, have uh, your cultural center and uh, just so many things that have sprung up in the last 10, 15 years. And uh, uh, Parish Hall being uh, redone. And now I understand that there's a new culture or a new museum that's going to be uh, put into place uh, soon, I hope. So I, I, I think I've seen a lot of changes, and all for the betterment. I see nice homes now for that the people have. Mm -hmm. Years ago, a lot of homes were run down, and yeah. people have decent living conditions now. What, what is your uh, observation and opinion on the, uh, the per capita payment that the tribe gives out? 
Well, personally, I like it. Uh, I think that uh, when they talk about uh, 15,000 Oneidas, I really think maybe about uh, <coughs> uh, only about three or 5,000 people really have the benefits of what uh, the tribe offers. Uh, so those per capita for those people that live in Kansas or in California or other parts of the, the country are the only thing that they get from the tribe. Um, and those little extra funds, even though I have to pay taxes, I pay taxes in the city and what I earn uh, comes in handy um, for, uh, say, the weekend I'm going to come up in October for, uh, uh, for expenses. It's not a whole lot of money, but it certainly does help. So. I like it. Okay. Now, uh, what, uh, what recommendations would you give to our youth that are coming uh, behind us? Uh, I'd, I'd lend them a hand. Well, to get involved with the community. Um, living out here among your own people, I think you take yourself for granted. Uh, and you, uh, you just need to get involved with all the cultural aspects of you, who you are, uh, so you know um, your history and know who you are, so you can uh, be proud of who you are. Um, when I live in the city of Milwaukee, and we have such a diverse group of people, uh, people don't really know much about their history. Um, but as Native people, um, if we don't know our history, and we have all these stereotype images that are pointed at us. Uh, how can we defend what is right and wrong uh, if we don't know anything about uh, our history or who we are? Uh, there's, there's so many issues today uh, that are out there that our young people need to get involved with. And uh, they need to stay in school. Uh, they need to get uh, stay close to their families, uh, leave those drugs and alcohol, um, and just try to be a responsible individual, do the best they can. Okay. Is there anything that uh, you want to cover that I neglected? I don't think so. I think you covered it pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. well, we want to thank you for coming and taking the time to come down here share this with us. Mm -hmm. We appreciate it. And I think in the future, if this, you know, all of these interviews are going to be helpful to our youth. And uh, like you say, uh, the there's a lot of history that can be derived out of, you know, the stories that you told mm -hmm. and uh, stories that these other elders have told. Mm -hmm. And hopefully that'll make them feel stronger. Yeah, I hope so. Okay. Okay. Thank right. you. Okay, go ahead and tell me about that. Well, a year ago, um, there was an article written f uh, by a man from Oklahoma on women who did fancy dancing. And he had a number of names of women who did this type of dancing. And then this last January, I got a call from a lady uh, from Oklahoma that uh, wanted to do an interview of uh, myself because I kind of represented the northern area and another lady from uh, Oklahoma to tell kind of uh, our experiences as dancers. And then this last June, they did this feature story about uh, my years as a fancy dancer and just gave uh, uh, backs of, of uh, from when we dance. That? It's uh, news from Indian country and oh, it's a uh, yes. June 14th issue. So I was, I didn't know this article was going to be in, and when I came up over the 4th, a number of people were telling me about this article. So today I finally picked up uh, the newspaper and got to see the article. And it was quite a thrill <laughs> to have them do this. Okay. Thank you.